Okay, so now we've come to the third lesson in this unit um, entitled A Life of Commitment. And um, we've seen uh, Christ's commitment to us, and the second lesson was our commitment to Christ. And so this week, the third lesson is committed to his word. And the lesson comes from Psalms 119. So let's look at verses 1 through, one through 8 to start with. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. They have commanded us, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with, with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous uh, judgments. I'll keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Uh, so one of the first things I want to notice is that look at all these references to his word. Um, it, in verse 1, it talks about the way, the law. In verse 2, it, it talks about testimonies. Precepts in verse 4, your statutes in verse 5, your commandments in verse 6, your judgments in verse 7. So there's like eight different references, different ways of saying um, his word. And so I thought that was interesting. And so the way is talking about uh, blessed are the undefiled in the way, uh, referred to in verse 1 there, obviously means your manner of life. And so <clears throat> and in this instance, the, the way of righteousness. Uh, so it says um, uh, blessed or happy. Uh, my Bible says blessed, but there are translations that say happy. Either is good. Blessed are we if we walk in the law, his word, of the Lord, and um, in other words, there's a blessing that comes with walking in His way, studying His word, obeying His His word. And verse two also starts off with the word uh, blessed or happy, and it says if, if we keep His testimonies, and so that would be then a reference to things concerning uh, God's character. And so the phrase whole heart. Um, is interesting too because in the Hebrew language uh, it's in the emphatic position which means it's it, like that, that's heavy or it's forceful right emphatic position and so what what it means though is that a pure obedience from the heart is alone acceptable uh, I mean the heart's got to be clean the heart's got to be pure we can be obedient without having a pure heart we understand that. I mean, you, you can do things um, and it'd be a burden to you. No reward there. No reward there. All right? You can attend worship services. You can come to Sunday school. You know, but if it's a, a burden to you, you know, you've got some ministry going on and it's really a burden to you, uh, there, there's just something really wrong with that. And so you, you've got a heart problem and um, you need to see, see about that something obviously wrong all right so if you're serving in any capacity and it's a burden uh, you really do need to do some checking up uh, verse 3 um, they also do no iniquity they walk in his ways and so here what we have here is a positive and a negative uh, those that walk in God's law that's the positive will keep clear of the iniquity which is the negative the negative and so it's not enough to know what to do you got to do it and so many of us probably know a whole lot more Bible than what we're actually doing and so that's what it's getting out here it's not enough just to know it we also got to do it in other words the doers of the word are not here at all that comes from James so we we study or we read read and study the word so that we can apply it I mean that's that's the, the whole thing and what I try to do in teaching is, um, you know, give the technical sense of the words. Uh, what's it actually saying? The doctrine, the theology. But we, have, we also have to apply it. Right? So once we learn something, then we need to apply that. And so we, we read and study so that we learn it mentally, but then we've got to apply it. All right? Verse 4. Uh, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. So another word there. Again, we have have a, a word here that's in the emphatic position. And uh, you, 
it's a reference to God. Uh, some translations thou, but it's a reference to God. And God is in the emphatic position. So we could read word this verse and read it like this. God has ordained his precepts for diligent obedience. God's serious about this. All right? We're talking about a pure heart here uh, above, above all else. <clears throat> we got to observe um, what we learn and do it diligently. And by doing so, then, our lives are happy or blessed, uh, peaceful. Okay, so there's a promise here in that if we'll read it and study it and then apply it, uh, do it God's way, basically, then there's a blessing um, coming from, from that. Verse 5, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. So here's, here's a bit of a break here. The first four verses are concerned more with the law itself, and these next four verses uh, concern our relation to his word. Now the writer, who is unknown, is praying that he may always ob observe his statutes. Now, that's a pretty good prayer there. Uh, keep that uh, first and foremost, right? So verse 6 uh, is, um, Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. All right, so here's a reference to God and man. That is, if we follow God's precepts, follow his word, his way, his manner of life for us, then we will never be ashamed before God or man. You never have to apologize for doing right. All right? Never be ashamed before God or man. Doing right is always in fashion. And we'll never be ashamed by, by doing right. And never have to apologize. Never have to repent for doing, doing right. Now verse 7, I'll praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. Now, <clears throat> before the law or his word can be followed, it has to be learned or understood. And so we learn it first. And then obedience will follow. And so here's another um, time then or opportunity that I'll say again. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than Bible reading Bible study. We don't know what God's will is for our lives. We don't even know how to pray appropriately until we've been in the Word. Nothing is more important than Bible study. Now verse 8, I will keep your statutes, O do not forsake me utterly. Uh, so he said, my wish, my prayer, or my desire is to follow God. But in order to carry it out, he says, don't forsake me because without you, O God, I don't have the strength to do, to do it right. And, and that's, that's the case. And so here we are then in one of those situations where we pray without ceasing, right? Always in an attitude of prayer. Now, what can we uh, apply? How can we apply some of these things? Uh, number one, in the first two verses, the word blessed or happy is used, and it was a reference to wholehearted service. All right? So here's the point I want to make. Half-hearted service can lay no hold on those promises. So you've got some ministry going, you've got some calling, and you're serving the Lord, and you're doing it half speed, or you're doing it half-hearted, uh, don't pretend to think you're going to get a blessing. It, it's, it has become a burden to you. What we're talking about here is whole-hearted service. Half-hearted service uh, doesn't get the promise, doesn't get the blessing, doesn't get the happiness. And, and many Christians tend to live in a miserable merry-go-round, all right? It's like we're, we sin, we repent. We sin, we repent. We sin, we repent. It's like an up and down, constantly merry-go-round. Well, that, that's half-hearted. And, you know, that's not wholehearted. Uh, falling down, rising up, it's just a perpetual life under the rebuke of our conscience. You know, there's no peace for that. There's no happiness for that. There's no blessings coming from that. The happy life, the blessed life spoken of here is live in the sunshine of God's love and, and our love for him. And that state, my friends, is better than life itself. Nothing is more miserable than for a Christian to be out of God's will. Nothing. There's no peace, there's no joy, 
Your conscience is always nagging you, and it's doing it for a reason. Hey, and on top of that, uh, you want to pay attention to it for two reasons. First of all, obey it. And number two, if the Holy Spirit is living on the inside, that means you're a Christian, and you ain't getting away with it. And the only way you're going to get back to uh, peace and happiness and joy and contentment is to get right with God. And if you're doing something for God and it's half-hearted, um, God said there ain't going to be no blessing. It, it is, you're going to be miserable. It's a miserable merry-go-round, up and down, up and down. Half-hearted service spoils, always spoils your worship and your praise. You think about it. You're in a worship service and uh, the musicians are playing praise and worship and you're just not in it. Right? Just not in it. Half-hearted service always spoils that. And you can't worship right. You can't praise right. Nothing is more miserable to our soul than to be lukewarm. And to be lukewarm basically is backslidden. So if there's no peace and joy there, something's wrong. Something's wrong. All right? So we have to ask ourselves the question then, is God calling you back? Is God calling us back? So the, the point of the lesson here or the application here is listen and obey. Listen and obey. Point number two. This psalm is, is teaching us that the word of God can be trusted to keep us from shame before our own conscience, before God, and before man. The Bible is teaching us that the only way to avoid shame is to live by his word and to um, study it and to obey it. And we shall surely uh, be filled with the love of God if we'll do that. Point number three. Where can a man find this happiness, this blessedness? Can you find it in a, in a new job or, or a new career? Can you find it in uh, getting a new truck, a new hunting rifle, a new, a new fishing boat? Uh, can you find it and get a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend? No. None of these things are going to bring you happiness. None of those things will bring contentment. It's been uh, proven, our own experience, over thousands of years of time, that uh, the only thing that brings happiness and contentment and peace and joy is being right in the center of God's will. And so a life lived according to his testimonies, according to his word, is the only life that's going to be free from guilt and shame. You know, modern psychology attempts to help man deal with the guilt of his past. But what man needs instead is to turn his life over to God for forgiveness. That's what man needs. Man needs to repent and accept God's forgiveness, his offer of salvation, and his offer of restoration, whichever the case may be. Then obedience to God's word opens the door to true happiness, because it opens the door to the very presence of God. There, a man's soul can find peace, a peace that passes all understanding. The Word of God has the power to cleanse us, and it also has the power to save us. It has the power to give us peace. And so we have to ask ourselves then, this third point I want to make here, is what are we looking for to make us happy? More things? More entertainment? Uh, more success in a career. Listen, the Word of God is the only safe place to put your trust in God. A man may say, well, how can I trust him? Well, how have you been doing in trusting worldly things? I mean, if you haven't given God's Word a try um, and you're in a mess, why not give God's Word a try? Give God's way a try. <clears throat> I can tell you from my own experience and from the experience of um, many who've been before for thousands of years that the Bible has never failed. God's Word has never failed. And so if you've tried everything else, why not try in God's way? Uh, now, verses um, 9 through 11. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. That's probably one of the most um, quoted and memorized 
different verses in the old Bible. Uh, verse 9. The way this verse reads, the writer is uh, a really old man, and, uh, and he's anxious to give advice uh, to young men. And so that, that's a good thing. You know, we got some older uh, gentlemen out here. Uh, Brother Jesse Crawford comes to mind. And, you know, he's, uh, I think, mid-80s or upper 80s. And he's, he's been to a few road games. And he has great wisdom. And uh, older men like that, um, if you've got a word of encouragement to young men, give it. I mean, you've, like, earned that. And uh, it's now um, a part of your gift that you have lived these many years and you've seen God work. Share that wisdom with, with these young men. You know, here's a picture of a dad giving advice to a son or maybe a granddad giving advice to a grandson or any number of godly men you know, who can influence the life of a young person. And the younger, the better. Now, verse 10, uh, we read with my whole heart I have sought you, oh, let me not wander from your commandments. That is, let me not accidentally or through ignorance uh, stray from the right path. So that's what he said there. Verse 11 um, really complete, completes verse 10. You know, hide your word I've hidden in my heart and I may not sin against uh, you. And so verse 11 then completes verse 10, or it does so in my mind. And, and the way... Uh, accidents and ignorance is fixed is by learning God's word. That's just straight up. The way you fix ignorance and maybe stupidity too is by reading God's word and then applying it. Learning God's word, memorizing the verses and applying it to your heart. To have God's promises laid up in your heart is the only security against being surprised into sin. And so we learn God's word and we can apply these precepts and these, these truths to our lives such that we can see things coming. You know, once you learn, like, uh, for example, the devil's tactics, um, you can see them coming. And then, rather than being ignorant, and getting into a mess, you, are, you you have knowledge and you see it coming and you can avoid it. That's always the better game plan, right? Uh, so how, how can we apply some of this to our life here then? So look back at verse nine. We have here a difficult question here. The question is asked implying that all roads to happiness and peace and contentment have already been tried and found to be lacking or found to be inadequate. So the question also implies that the young man's way has already been defiled. In other words, he's done, he done messed up. And so it's very true and it's very sad. And so here where I would stick into <clears throat> um, dads with young families, don't ever let there be a time when those kids are not in Sunday school. You bring them up in Sunday school and you bring them up teaching them to read their Bible and to pray. And uh, there'll be a lot of, that'll, that'll return reward right there. All right. So <clears throat> the question also implies that the young man's way has already been defiled. So true but sad. Right, so the young man has already started off down a wrong road. And that road is getting worse by the day. So here's a young man then, in, in this in our verses here, here's a young man that has that has already defiled himself. He's already gotten into a mess. He, he's not um, um, a, a clean way. Um, he, he's, he's got he's going down a road that needs to be cleaned up in other words <clears throat> so it's not a clean life that needs to be kept clean he's already in a mess and now he needs to clean up and so you know being clean and keeping yourself clean that's difficult enough but being in a mess usually requires a lot more effort um, so here's a young man that he's defiled and he needs to be cleaned up or made clean Right, so here's the picture of, of a man that's allowed his passions then to control him. And, and um, his mind has been controlled. All right? he, he's been impatient. He has no control over, um, over himself. And so he has already given heed then to all sorts of temptations of the flesh. 
His heart is inexperienced, and his heart is also untaught. So there is uh, every deceit of the world as uh, far as unbelief and doubt and fear of the truth is going on here. And here, here is a lot of fuel then and a lot of fire. All right? And so, and it comes, and it comes together here in youth. I mean, how many stories have been told? You know, we're talking about a young man here. How many stories have been told about the youngster that gets into trouble and he winds up in jail or prison as a young person? It seems to always come together in youth, or it, that seems to be the experience of just observation out there. Uh, so what can prevent then this fuel and fire coming together to make this huge fire? Well, it's a question that does have an answer. And the answer is always found in the Word of God. You know, we could talk about Joseph. You know, he wasn't a perfect kid, but he did it right. You know, he grew up uh, fearing God, and his brothers hated him. And you know the whole story. He wound up in Potiphar's house, and she tried to seduce him, and he he got clear of that. You know, how can I do this great um, uh, wickedness and sin against God? Well, Joseph had already made up his mind to do it right. I mean, he had already gone down the right path, right? And lots of other examples. You know, we could talk about Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, all those, Ezra. I mean, there's a lot of examples in the Bible where they did it right. Remember what Daniel said when he was um, taken captive? He said he had all, he had purposed in his heart. All he had his mind made up. Ain't going to be defiled. And so those noble uh, Hebrew boys were contemporary with Daniel. Uh, they did it right. We know their story. Uh, we don't have time to go into that. But uh, they didn't bow down either. They had already made up their mind, right? So how were they able to hold up? How, how were they able to hold up? Because we read about them and they're like heroes in the Bible. And we say, oh, well, that was that day and maybe God was closer. No, it's the same. He's the same God. He's just as close to us today as he was to Daniel. The difference is, is that they had purposed in their heart. They had God's word hid in their heart. And they had already made up their mind that they were going to do it God's way. So how were they able to hold up? They knew God. They knew God's word. And they had it hid in their heart. And all the testimony now that they've had for thousands of years, we still talk about um, how they held up. It was all about God, right? Because they had hid God's word in their hearts. Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Daniel said, he had purposed in his heart. And those three Hebrew boys said, we're not going to bow down. How could they stay clean? They started out clean and they stayed clean. Because they kept God's word. They kept God's word in their heart. How does a defiled man clean up? Same way. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that has become one of my maybe my favorite Bible verse. First John 1, 9. If you'll confess, he said, I'll clean you up. Man, I'm glad it's in there too. God's word can keep us from thinking bad thoughts. That's right. It can keep us from doing sinful things. And it can keep us from saying sinful words. God's word has the power to keep us from, from all these sinful things. Or all those things are going to keep us from God's Word. 